بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله ولي الصالحين وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين اللهم صل وسلم على عبدك ورسولك محمد وآله وصحبه ومن دعا بدعوته واستند بسنته إلى يوم الدين وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد all praises are due to Allah, Lord of the worlds, and surely Allah is the friend and protector of the righteous. And I bear witness that Allah is one and has no partners, and that Muhammad, son of Abdullah, is his servant and his last messenger. May Allah always and constantly send peace and blessings to Muhammad, to his family, to his companions, to all those who call to his way and establish his sunnah to the day of judgment. As to what follows, my beloved brothers and sisters, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I bring you greetings uh, from your brothers and sisters uh, down under uh, on the African side. And I bring you feelings of solidarity. And I want to speak to you tonight not as a great scholar of Islam, uh, not as a uh, intellectual speaking up down to you, but I want to speak to you as a brother. Not just speaking from the mind, but speaking from the heart. Recently, we were visited by um, a very important person, uh, Sheikh Rayad Salah, Sheikh of Masjid al-Aqsa. We had his delegation with us in South Africa. He spoke to us in sincerity. And he asked us to deliver a message anywhere we go. And that is a message of optimism. It is a message of hope, that there is hope. And he showed us that even though they are surrounded by Zionist forces, and even though there is a demolition being done under the masjid, everything it seems to be against them, the press is against them. The military is against them. But they still feel strongly in their hearts that vi victory will ultimately be with the Muslims. And they are hanging on to the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And being in that situation puts them in a similar situation to the case of Musa alayhi salam. When he was at the water and when all help is leaving him. And then he turns to his creator. And it has happened to the Anbiya, alayhim as -salam. At that point, when it seems like there is nothing, and as the case of the Sahaba, radiallahu anhum, where they are shouting, Meta Nasrullah, when is the help of Allah? And we know that Allah has answered that His help is close. It is near. It is all around us. But we need to be sincere with ourselves to really look within ourselves and our situations to see how can we uh, become part of the solution and not be part of the problem. I speak to you with sincerity in coming from a part of the world where people are suffering in the Hayat al-Dunya. In southern part of Africa there is poverty, there is disease, but at the same time, people are rebuilding their lives. There is hope of people going from a state of poverty to a state of wealth. And many innocent people are accepting Islam. And they look at the Muslim world, look at the condition of Muslims to try to understand what is happening. And I traveled to many countries looking at Muslims. And I realized and I want to reflect along with you tonight on our situation. I realize that Muslims are living in strategic positions, strategic waterways, strategic mountain passes. We are sitting on over the 40% of the mineral wealth of this planet. We have great intellectuals, we have scholars, we have universities, we have wealth. We have so much wealth, some people don't know what to do with it. 
Recently, even here, they are praising Muslim leaders who are spending hundreds and millions of dollars on horses. But at the same time, you travel to, to, to West Africa, travel to Mali and Chad and, and Niger in the middle of the Sahara. And you will see Muslims who hardly have anything to eat. They hardly have enough water to make wudu. But they are strong in their faith. They are holding on to their faith. In that condition. But we as an ummah, we as individuals, we have to look at this contradiction. Great wealth, some of the richest people on the face of the planet earth. Some of our leaders have so much money, you don't have enough zeros to count it. And they don't even put them in the top ten with wealth. Because they don't want us to appear like we're wealthy. So much money, we don't know what to do with it. But at the same time, poverty. Military strength, hundreds and thousands of soldiers standing at arms. Waiting for a command from their leaders. But at the same time, children being gunned down in Philistine. In Gaza, people surrounded. The largest prison on earth. Tortured in front of the eyes of the world. And the eyes of the other Muslims. This is unprecedented in our history. It's unprecedented. And even as you know, we look back into Islamic history, even in the time of the Abbasids. Because many people say, well, no, we didn't have Islam. Only the Khulafa al-Rashidin and then Islam ended. But you go back to the, that period of time, and you will see in the Umayyads and the Abbasids, in that period, political struggle going on. But the Muslims had Izza. They had self-respect. And Izza does not just mean power, physical power. Aziz is something which is dear. Something which is valuable. Self-esteem. And in the famous case of one Muslim woman captured by the Christians and she cries out, Wa Mu'tasima. She cries out to the Khalifa, al Mu'tasim, Billah. And he sends a letter to the Christian leader telling him, release the Muslim woman. If you do not release her, I will send an army so big that the front of it will reach you and the back will still be coming from me. And the Christian seeing this, knowing the Izza, one person, just one person crying out, Sema and Wata, hear and obey, and releases the Muslim woman with female bodyguards to take her back to the lands of Islam. What is that in relationship to Serbians raping thousands of Bosnian women? Abu Hurayb in Iraq. Gaza in Philistine. Compare that. But yet at the same time, so much material wealth. Intellectuals, so much access to knowledge. We can now access Bukhari and Muslim, all of the hadith on a disk. Imam Bukhari, rahimahullah, would travel thousands of kilometers for one hadith. We can put it in the computer and carry it in our pocket. So this is a contradiction. This is a serious contradiction. And at the time of contradictions, major incidents have happened in the Muslim world in order to straighten us out, to bring us back to the path. And if you look back at the time of the coming around the 13th century of the common era, and you will see in that time period, a king living in the uh, uh, eastern, northern, uh, uh, oriental areas, living in Mongolia. He sends his emissaries into the Muslim world, and they are, his emissaries are disgraced and embarrassed and sent back. Then he sent them again, and they were killed. And this man went to his son God, and said in words, there is only one son on this earth and there is only one Khan that will rule this, this planet. There is only one Khan. And Genghis Khan opened up a massacre of Muslims which is unparalleled. Going through the Muslim world, 
disrespecting everybody, only respecting force, coming down into the heartlands of Islam and destroying the, the Khilafat, killing the Khalifa, burning the books, throwing the books in the river. And this was a punishment. Well, what was happening at that time in Baghdad? Ibn al athir rahimahullah, one of the great uh, uh, writers wrote, he writes in his book, I wish my mother never gave birth to me. So I would not have to be the one who had to write this down. Somebody had to write it down though. And he describes the situation. And he, and he shows in the situation that the, 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 from Baghdad to Mecca, at the time of Hajj, there was nobody making Hajj. There was no major delegation to make Hajj. 